So we, we, I'll just, while he's doing that, I'll just come up real quick. Um, okay. So we have been talking this semester, um, a little series called The Faith Next Door. So we've looked at topics um, such as Baha'i, the Baha'i faith, Judaism, we've looked at Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Scientology, Islam, Islam last week. Uh, and so we are into, um, again, we started, we did Judaism and um, we're into Islam this week. I mean, sorry, we were into Islam last week. This week we're gonna look at Christianity, the three, mono, the three monotheistic religions. So what does monotheism mean, somebody? One God. One God, one God. yeah. Belief in one God, right? Worship of one God. So um, those three uh, monotheistic religions, Judaism, um, Islam, and then Christianity. So we're gonna look at the core tenet of Christianity, which is the resurrection tonight. So Mike. Take it away. Thank you, Melissa. All right, yes, so tonight we will be talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Outline. We'll talk about the importance of the resurrection, some notable scholars, minimal facts argument, um, which if you've never heard that before, um, this will be a, a good thing to, uh, to see and to memorize and talk about engaging people, you can engage skeptics uh, with this argument that we're going to talk about. We'll talk about alternative theories and how to refute them as well. So, let's get right into it. Why is the resurrection important? Let me throw that out there. So what, just right off the top of your head, why would you say the resurrection is important? Yes? Because if Jesus didn't die and rise again, why are we here? If Jesus didn't die and rise again, why are we here? Can't really add to that, can you? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe you can. It's the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation of our faith, yes. And when we think about the apostles, that's the main reason they're going out and spreading the message. So if the message is <coughs> the act is Paul, the message is Paul, so it makes no sense. Okay, good. Let's see how you did. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, so first and foremost, I guess, maybe not foremost, but first of all, yes, it sets Christianity apart from all the other religions. Why? Because the central claim of Christianity can actually be investigated, okay? To, to, to claim belief in the resurrection is not just an article of faith, which it is, but it's not just an article of faith. It's actually um, something that can be examined uh, using historical methods and tools, okay? We can actually look at this. Um, you know, other religions, so uh, Islam, for example, you know, we're told to, if you want to find out if the Quran is true, just read it for yourself and, and you'll realize that no one else could have written a book like the Quran, okay? But that, is that objective or subjective? It kind of puts it back on you, right? It becomes a subjective thing. Mormonism, right? Read the Book of Mormon. You'll know if it's true because you'll get the burning in the bosom, as they say. Again, objective or subjective. It kind of puts it in the subjective realm, okay? Jesus took, he basically made the... The, 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 claim, the central claim of Christianity, not a subjective uh, idea, but an objective idea, okay? We don't have to worry about our own feelings when it comes to this. We can investigate it with uh, historical methods and tools, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, it's either true or it's false. Jesus either rose from the dead or he didn't. If he did rise from the dead, did he only rise for Christians? No, if it's true, it's true for everyone, right? That's what makes it objective, okay? We've talked about this before. Um, another reason, our, our eternal destinies ride on the truth of this historical event. Okay, atheism says when you die, you just go in the ground and at some point you become worm food. Hinduism says you're going to come back and be reincarnated, as does, Bud as does Buddhism. Um, yeah, so Islam as well, going back to Islam, um, the eternal destiny of those in Islam well, you face God, but are you facing it um, on someone else's righteousness or your own deeds? In Islam, it's your own deeds. You have to face a, a righteous, uh, you have to face Allah based on your own merits. Okay, so our eternal destinies ride on the truth of this historical event. In addition, it's the ultimate validation of the truth claims of Jesus. Jesus made divine claims about himself. He claimed to forgive sins. He claimed... Um, 
He claimed to be the unique son of God, and he also claimed that one day he would return in glory to judge the living and the dead. Okay, these are claims of Jesus. So if the resurrection is true, it is the ultimate, val and he made other claims as well, but this is the ultimate validation of the truth claims of Jesus. And as, who said that uh, it didn't really matter? Michaela? Is she? Oh, she's already gone. Well, Michaela was kind of echoing a sentiment of Paul, the apostle, as well. Paul tells us, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you were still in your sins. Um, and you were all still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people, uh, we are of all people most to be pitied. So Paul in the New Testament, he, he tells us, if it's not true, what are we doing? We should be pitied. And he goes on to later and say as well in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So there's a lot riding on the truth of this event. All right. So notable scholars. Probably first and foremost, uh, the scholar that's done the most work and that this presentation is basically based around is the work of Dr. Gary Habermas. And uh, two books in particular, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, where a lot of the material, again, that we're covering tonight comes from. Great book. If you don't have it, highly recommend that you add it to your library. Uh, and The Historical Jesus as well. Um, Gary Habermas... He surveyed almost 30 years of German, French, and English um, uh, critical scholarship uh, relating, to the relating to Jesus' resurrection, looking at over 1,400 articles over 30 years from 1975. So he took all this information and basically compiled it, and this is the product. And he also, there's a co-author, Michael Lacona, but um, Gary Habermas is usually the one out there that's... Um, that you'll often see as kind of the face of, of the book that he wrote there. So highly recommended. Um, so he, he developed what's called this minimal facts argument that we're going to look at. The beauty of the minimal facts argument that we're going to talk about is it considers only those historical data that are so strongly attested to that virtually every scholar that looks at the subject will grant them as facts, even non-believing scholars. Okay, so it's a very powerful argument. Just using a few facts, it makes a very compelling case because these facts have to be explained. So we're going to look at that. So there's two basic requirements for the historical facts that we're going to talk about. Uh, any history majors in here? No history majors? You were a history major, right? Wait, sorry. 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 <laughs> That's okay. What? <laughs> yeah, I know, but you came in the I heard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, so if you're a history major, I mean, you realize that when it comes to events, especially in antiquity, we don't have videotapes. We don't have photographs, okay? But we, we can investigate the past based on sources. And when we're talking about antiquity, uh, we're mainly talking about either physical evidence, uh, archaeology, that kind of thing and also written sources, okay? So for a historian, you know, our knowledge of the past comes exclusively through sources, and especially so with regard to uh, ancient sources. Um, so what are some of the criteria that are used in this minimal facts argument? I'm just gonna go over these hopefully pretty quickly. I don't wanna get too in depth with these, but again, this is, this is how history works, basically. Um, when you're looking at how can we reconstruct the past when we don't have videotape, photographs, audio recordings, things like that? So for the minimal facts argument, the facts that we're going to talk about, they must be strongly evidenced on the basis of accepted principles of textual and historical analysis. Well, what are those? Kind of five areas here. Uh, multiple and independent sources. Why is that important? Because if you have more than one source, it adds to the credibility of the event. Enemy attestation. You know, it's one thing for your mom to say that you're an honest person. You might believe her, but you might have some reservation. But if someone who hates your guts says that you're an honest person, that's an enemy attestation. They don't have any bias against you, right? I mean, they hate you, but they're, but they're still willing to concede that you're an honest person. So when we look at history, if there's something that someone who's not sympathetic to your cause, 
um, your movement, if they say something that corroborates a fact that, that you also say, that's powerful with regard to history because your enemy is attesting to that fact. Principle of embarrassment. So if a statement of history is embarrassing to the author or movement, it's unlikely to be invented or fabricated. It reflects honest reporting rather than creative storytelling. You know, people don't usually make up details that will weaken their case. So throughout the New Testament, there are certain what would be called embarrassing facts that are recorded in Scripture for us. And you would think if this was something that was being made up, they would have not put those things in there. So for example, um, a couple of examples here. We all know that Peter, he denied Christ three times after he explicitly said, quote, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Even if I must die. And then what does he do? Shortly thereafter, he denies Christ three times. Now, it's more likely than not that that actually happened because that's kind of embarrassing for Peter, for that to be recorded, right? Um, after Jesus is crucified, what, did, what do the disciples do? They all go run and hide because they're scared to death. That's kind of embarrassing, but yet it's recorded. So it attests to the truthfulness of the fact of that data, okay? Um, there, there's a lot more. I don't want to get into it right now, but this is, again, this is one of the criteria used for the facts here. Eyewitness testimony, it's stronger than secondhand or thirdhand testimony. Eyewitness testimony is firsthand testimony. And then early testimony, um, you know, the closer to an event uh, of the testimony, the more credible it is. And what we're going to see as we go through some of these uh, criteria in play. The second requirement for these facts is they must be acknowledged by the vast majority of critical New Testament scholars. Liberal, skeptical, atheist, agnostic, and of course, you know, Christian conservative scholars as well. But these facts that we're going to talk about, it's not just the Christians that are acknowledging these facts. It's liberal, skeptical, agnostic, and atheist. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Okay, so the minimal facts argument. We're going to talk about five facts. I always forget to hand this out. Let me hand these around. I guess just do one on each side. Thank you, sir. Something else about the minimal facts argument that I didn't mention before. We're not arguing for the inspiration or the inerrancy of Scripture. Now, we do, we, we do acknowledge that. But when you're talking to someone who's skeptical, that's not the argument that you're making. These are facts that are acknowledged by secular historians, skeptical historians, atheist historians, okay? So if someone tries to engage you with a, uh, an argument about inspiration or inerrancy, that's not the argument. These facts must be addressed because we're not even talking about inspiration or inerrancy. These facts are acknowledged by people who don't already believe that. So what are the facts? First fact of the minimal facts argument, Jesus died by crucifixion. Now that doesn't sound earth shattering, it sounds kind of like, wow, so what? But, but why do you think this fact is important? If you know anything about what's kind of... If he didn't die, then how could he resurrected? That's good. If he didn't die, how could he have resurrected? There's something else out there in the world right now that's, there's a certain movement that... He didn't escape to France. <laughs> didn't escape to France. Have you heard of the Jesus myth movement? These mythicists yeah. who claim that Jesus didn't even exist? Yeah, if you haven't heard that, it's actually... Uh, now, you won't find many scholars, if any. There may be one or two. Um, but it's not really a scholarly argument. But you may hear this kind of at the internet level, that Jesus never even existed. So it's important to say that Jesus died, number one, because if he didn't die, how could he have risen? But also, he existed in history as a real person. The New Age movement? Not really. It's more just this... Just off-the-rails kind of skepticism about Jesus even existing as a 
historical, excuse me, figure. Um, I think the New Age movement has different objections. So, anyway, so Jesus died by crucifixion. Second fact, the empty tomb. Okay, so Jesus was publicly executed in Jerusalem. The proclamations of his post-mortem appearances and the empty tomb was in what city at first? Jerusalem. Okay, it would have been impossible for Christianity to get off the ground if the empty tomb, uh, if the tomb wasn't empty, because it was in Jerusalem where Jesus was executed. All they had to do was go down and look in the tomb. And yet, Jerusalem is the very city where Christianity started. They didn't go off 200 miles away and start something over here and then come back. It started in Jerusalem. Um, so the empty tomb is also an important fact. Third fact of the minimal facts argument. The disciples believed that they had seen the resurrected Jesus and were transformed from scared followers in hiding to bold proclaimers willing to die for their faith. Now you go... There are atheist scholars who believe this, or that will acknowledge this fact. Well, they're not acknowledging necessarily that they saw the risen Jesus, but they will acknowledge that the disciples saw something, that they believed something happened because of this. They were transformed, and they were willing to die for their faith. Many of them were martyrs and did not recant. So even these skeptical scholars They'll say something happened, and we're going to look at some of these alternative explanations, okay? But, you, but do, do, I mean, do you see that distinction? They're not saying, oh, yeah, they saw, they saw Jesus resurrected. They don't acknowledge that necessarily, but they'll say they saw something. And, and we'll, we'll get into more of that. Fourth fact, James, the brother of Jesus and a skeptic during Jesus' life, he believed, he had an experience and believed that he had seen the resurrected Jesus, and was converted to the faith. He did not acknowledge Jesus as Lord during Jesus' life. After the fact, something happened, and he was transformed and became a believer. Fifth, Paul, an enemy and a persecutor of Christians, had an experience and believed that he had seen the resurrected Jesus and was converted to the faith. Five facts, and, and there are other facts that, that Gary Habermas has also put together, but just these five facts, we'll see, are pretty powerful, and they need to be explained somehow. Questions? So, what is the best explanation of these facts? That's what we're going to talk about. Well, let me ask you this. So, if, if let's say a a skeptical scholar, atheist scholar, agnostic scholar, if they're looking at these facts, how, why do you suppose they arrive at a different conclusion than, say, a Christian would? They'll acknowledge these, but they're arriving at a different conclusion. They're not saying Jesus actually rose from the dead. Like, what's going on with them, do you think? What would be guiding their interpretation? Staying within the natural realm. That's a big part of it. Yeah, you, you also had your hand up. Um, maybe they're biased. <laughs> right, bias. And that bias, I would agree, would be towards naturalism. Now, we've talked about worldviews. Okay, so, so a worldview is a set of beliefs, values, presuppositions, and ideas through which we view, understand, and interpret reality. Okay, so if your worldview is naturalism, what that means is everything must be explained within the natural world. The natural world, anything that happens must be explained within the natural world. There is no supernatural. There's no beyond nature. Everything must be explained within nature. So if that's your bias, if that's your overriding presupposition, you're going to see these alternative theories, they spring out of that worldview. They must be explained within nature. Nothing supernatural exists in that worldview. So they got to explain those facts somehow. Everybody follow? Okay. So what are some of these alternative theories? We're going to talk about swoon theory, wrong tomb, stolen body, legend theory, hallucination theory. So we'll start with the swoon theory. Also known as the apparent death theory. 
And it says that, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He merely fainted from exhaustion, or he took a drug that made him look dead, and then later he revived in the cool, damp air of the tomb. That's the theory. So again, remember, naturalism must be explained within nature, okay? So this is one way of explaining some of the facts, anyway. Anyone see any problems right off the bat with swoon theory? Jay. Doesn't explain Paul's conversion. Right. Doesn't explain Paul's conversion. Anyone else? Yeah. Don't they like make sure you're dead before they take you off the cross, like the blood of the legs, like that? Yeah. So it doesn't really take seriously the idea of crucifixion, okay? <laughs> and what we know about crucifixion. So obviously these are um, images from the Passion of the Christ. Um, it certainly gives structure to our imagination of how horrible it must have been to be crucified. Um, but the Ro- yes, the Romans, they were professional executioners, okay? This wasn't their first time at the rodeo when they hung Jesus on the cross and, and killed him. They, they, they were professional executioners. They had this down to a science. Crucifixion results in death. Swoon theory doesn't take seriously what we know about the horrendous scourging, torture, t- torture associated with the crucifixion, with any crucifixion, okay? And as you said, um, the pe- well, did you say that they pierced him as well? Is that what was... No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they broke the legs. Yeah. Right. Well, right. And in Jesus' case, they actually didn't break his legs. But again, the Romans were professionals. When, when you are being crucified as I understand it, you have to actually pull yourself up to exhale, okay? Yeah. So what's one way that the soldiers would know that you were probably dead on the cross? Rising. You're not moving anymore, right? I mean, you're just not moving. And in Jesus' case, they actually pierced his side with a spear to confirm that he was dead. And then also, um, Pilate confirmed Jesus' death when the centurion before with the centurion before giving the body to Joseph of Arimathea for burial. That's in Mark uh, 14, 44 and 45. I have a question. Yeah. I have a comment, but also even if even if you're he's drug, because you also have to have be a drug in the in this sense, then even then you'd still be moving, even if you're unconscious. Because it feels like, like that end part of it, it sounds like Romeo and Juliet, because Juliet wakes up in the <laughs> It sounds like it. It's exact, it sounds like it's actually like that. It's all, like you can still sell something to lie. Yeah, we're going to look at a little more as where this theory might not make a lot of sense either as well. Um, but, but they knew when people were dead, basically. And um, even if they were drugged, I mean, if you were pierced in the heart with a spear, you wouldn't last long after that. I can't imagine. <laughs> And again, it's not just Christians who are saying this. There are non-Christian historians from the first century that affirm Jesus died by crucifixion. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, and Tacitus, the most uh, preeminent Roman ancient historian of the time as well. Okay. Well, let's look at what some scholars have to say. I picked four of these gentlemen. These are all skeptical New Testament scholars. Okay. Gerd Ludeman, he says, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan co-founder of the Jesus Seminar. So when you're watching the History Channel and they always have the the Christian scholar who's, you know, it's a show about Christianity, but they always go to this guy. He's probably one of the most skeptical people out there. He's always saying why the Bible is not true and this and that. This is the guy they pick for those types of documentaries. He says that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical, historical can ever be. Marcus Borg, Jesus' death by Roman crucifixion is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. And last of all, Bart Ehrman, the crucifixion of Jesus by the Romans is one of the most secure facts we have about his life. Now, again, I just drive this point home because the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion is actually a very, very important fact. It puts to, to rest, um, and these are scholars, and that's the distinction. These guys are scholars. They're not internet atheists. They're not, uh, you know, whatever. They, these guys know what they're talking about. They say Jesus died. It also implies that he lived. Okay. Well, what about Boromir? What does he have to say? He says, one does not simply swoon during a full Roman crucifixion. So even Boromir knows. That should make it pretty clear. 
you know, even if, even if, let's just say, there was a crazy coincidence of events that he somehow survived the crucifixion. I mean, the disciples would would not have been convinced of a resurrection. They would have been convinced that this guy needs serious medical attention. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> somehow he's right. he's breathing. It would have taken him months to recover. There's no way that that would have been convincing. Yeah, so let's look at this. That's actually, a, you're, you're kind of sniffing me out there. Yes? And alongside that, even if he did wake up, how could he get out of the scene? Because it would take more than just him sliding the stone out of the way. To get it out of the way, get up like a two-ton stone out of the way and walk all the way home. Yep. Yeah, you guys are too logical. So you've been coming to Rasher Christie. You know all this stuff. You, you're, you're on it. So alternative theories, they're like Cinderella's glass slipper. Let's try them on and see if they fit, okay? So suppose, as Pastor Ware was saying, suppose that Jesus did survive the cross. Suppose that after great blood loss and many hours in the cold tomb without food, water, or assistance, he was able somehow to escape from the burial wrappings generate the leverage to roll away the stone from the inside, um, fight his way past the guards in his near-death condition, walk on pierced feet to return to the disciples without anyone else noticing him. This is what you have to believe for the swoon theory to be true. So, as Pastor Ware was saying, so would a battered, beaten, bleeding Jesus have inspired the disciples to hail him as a glorious conqueror of death? Would they have been motivated to start a worldwide movement based on the hope that someday they too would have a post-crucifixion body just like Jesus. It doesn't make sense, right? We laugh because it sounds absurd, but this is what you must believe to believe this theory. No, upon seeing Jesus in his bloody, grotesque, mangled condition, his followers would never have concluded that he had been miraculously resurrected. They would have called a doctor, gotten him in medical attention, as, as you said. Yeah. All right. Next theory, wrong tomb theory. Any guesses what this might be? (laughs) So the theory says that women were confused because in all four Gospels, the women are recorded as the ones who actually discover the empty tomb and are the first to see the risen Jesus, which actually that is, I didn't talk about this, but that is actually one of the embarrassing facts. Why? At the time, women's testimony was not given very much credibility at all. Okay, so if you're if you're going to concoct a story about Jesus rising from the dead, using women as your first uh, witnesses would not. If you were concocting a, concocting a story, you would have the men be the first to do it because it would sound more credible. But the fact that the women in all four gospels are the ones who find the empty tomb and see the risen Jesus. That's most likely obviously what happened because they recorded it, even though it was embarrassing. Okay, so this theory says that when the women found the tomb empty, they mistook it for Jesus' resurrection. Well, let's try it on and see if it fits. The Gospels record that the women were present when Jesus was placed in the tomb. Okay, from Luke 23, 55, it says the women who had come home, or I'm sorry, who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. So they saw the tomb that he was put in. And there are similar accounts as well in Matthew and Mark. Joseph of Arimathea, who was the owner of the tomb that Jesus was placed in, well, he certainly knew the location of his own tomb because he put Jesus in it. So if there had been any talk about an empty tomb, it seems pretty logical that Joseph of Arimathea could have just pointed them to the right tomb, right? The guards, they certainly knew the location of the tomb. And to believe this theory, it requires the absurd conclusion that Peter and John, who also went to the tomb later, and the Jewish and the Roman authorities, that they all went to the wrong tomb. It's not just the women. So you have to believe all these things for this theory to even hold water. And it provides no explanation for the transformation of James, who was a skeptic, and Paul, who was an enemy and a, pros- and a persecutor. Okay? The empty tomb didn't convince really anyone except John. In the, the Gospel of John, it says when John saw, he believed. But most other people, when they saw the empty tomb or they heard about it, 
They were confused. They thought the body had been stolen. It didn't really convince anyone. What convinced the, uh, the disciples, James and Paul, were the appearances. So the empty tomb by itself didn't really convince anyone. I saw a hand. Yeah. Right. The, the tomb was sealed, which basically it's not so much to keep someone inside. I mean, it would be very difficult to roll a stone, but it's to make sure that no one tampered with it from the outside. Because if you roll the stone away, they had, as I understand it, there were ropes and they had wax. So if you move the stone, it's going to pull the rope from the wax, like a wax seal. Um, but yeah, it's just to make sure that no one was going to mess with it. But you're right. There, there was a seal. Oh, was that it for that? Okay. Okay. So that's you know, the, the, uh, refuting the wrong tomb theory. Let's, what about the stolen body theory? I just mentioned it a second ago. That was actually um, one of the women thought that, that they said yeah. they, they've stolen, they've stolen him. Okay, that was her first thought. It wasn't like he's been resurrected. No, she thought, wait, someone's stolen him. Okay, but let's look at that theory. So the theory says that the followers of Jesus stole the body from the tomb, and then they conspired to lie and claim that Jesus had been resurrected, but knowing that he had not done such a thing. That's the theory. It's a conspiracy theory. Any problems with this theory that you might sense? Yeah. Well, one thing I would say before we get to problems is that this is probably the, the best of the alternate theories because it's the oldest. Um, it goes all the way back to uh, the Jewish authorities. Did I email this presentation to you? How do you know so? No. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. No, no, I'm just kidding. Yes, we're going to see that in just a second. Okay. No, no, I'm no, I, I, I'm, I'm just joking with you, Pastor Ware. So. Sorry. I'm no. Just <laughs> thunder over there. Yes. I've always thought that was a strange fact too. If you're going to steal the body, why take the linens off and right? It just it's it defies kind of common sense. Yeah. Well, one of the main problems. Why would they die if they knew it was a lie? Because they don't have enough mental capacity. These are all good. Man, y'all are sharp. Yes, so we're going to talk about all of these. If they were so afraid, what kind of changed them all of a sudden to be brave enough to go, I passed the Roman body, so mm -hmm. Jesus out. Yeah, so as Pastor Ware states, this actually is the only theory that dates from the first century. A lot of these other theories have, have come about much later, starting in the 1700s, 1800s, um, when you started to get into some skeptical uh, criticism, of uh, uh, textual criticism, criticism and things like that, this theory is actually recorded in the Bible, and it is from the first century. And it's from Matthew 28, 12 through 15. Um, it says, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And that's from uh, Matthew there. Well, also, I mean, oh. maybe um, if those barns allowed the body to be stolen, you know, like, they would be subject to death. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it would just what makes sense. They would just let the body be stolen, like, just, you know. Right, so let's try the theory on and see if it fits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what you must believe if, the, if you adhere to this theory. As Jeff said, they were, the disciples were stunned and scared. This is one of the embarrassing facts that I mentioned at the beginning, that they, well, after Jesus was crucified, they scattered and were hiding. They were scared... Yeah, yes, dis disillusioned, hiding, and fear after the death of Jesus. They don't really sound like the ones that are going to go out and attack a guard at the tomb and take the body out. How would a bunch of fishermen have fought off professional soldiers? Okay. And again, it fails to provide any explanation. This is why these facts, even though there's just a few, again, they have to account, these alternate theories have to account for all of the facts. 
Well, this doesn't account for the uh, transformation of James or Paul. In fact, as a skeptic or an enemy, if they heard this story, that probably would have fit into what their idea would have been the disciples might have done. So the, the empty tomb, if they stole the body, that's not what convinced James or Paul. An appearance convinced them. Yeah. This sort of goes back to what you're saying um, about the, why would they say something about a theory that was born if that's not something they case in, you know, in the Bible? Right, so this is an example of the enemy attestation as well. That, um, you know, if you say, if you say the dog ate my homework to the teacher, that might be a lie, but what's implied in that lie? <laughs> you don't, th there's no homework to be produced, right? So it may be a lie that the dog ate your homework, but it's still, it, you're, you're indirectly admitting that you don't have the homework. So to say that, uh, that the, the um, Pharisees uh, um, said that the disciples stole the body, that may not be true, but what are they acknowledging implicitly? But the body's not there to be produced, right? So everyone see that? It's like an enemy attestation of that fact, okay? And it's, it, it's not even a good lie because someone, uh, someone just mentioned back there, um, well, number one, if you were asleep, how would you know who stole the body? And also, what guard is going to admit that he was sleeping on watch because it was a capital offense, which means you could be killed. Romans were serious about stuff like that. No guard is going to admit that because he would be put to death. Okay, it just doesn't make sense. All right, but let's suppose that the disciples did steal the body. They would know that the resurrection was a, a lie and a hoax. They're in a position to know this because they were there. What accounts, this is what you were saying, what accounts for their transformation from scared followers into bold proclaimers willing to suffer persecution and die for their faith? if they knew it was a lie. If somebody were getting ready to crucify me for something that was a lie, as soon as I started to tie my hands down, I'd probably come clean <laughs> and say, no, no, I'm sorry, I made, I made this up, I'm lying. This is not the case of the, the disciples uh, being martyred. They died for what they believed. They would not uh, recant what they had seen and heard. So people may die willingly for something they believe to be the truth. Okay, so even now, you know, 2,000 years later, we were not there to, to see the resurrection. But we trust in those who were there. Okay, those that were there were in a position to either know, because they were eyewitnesses, um, or they were lying. No one willingly dies for a lie that they know is a lie. Okay, so does... So do, so, um, when you have radical Muslims who fly planes into buildings, does that prove the truth of uh, Islam? Not necessarily. Okay, they're, they're dying certainly for what they believe is true. But the distinction here is that the disciples knew. They didn't just believe it. They were there to know yes or no. They were either lying or what they saw was what they saw, and they were eyewitnesses. That's the distinction. So we, 2,000 years later, our trust is in this fact that they knew because they were there. Yeah. One of the things too that you see when you read the early uh, martyrdom accounts is that almost in almost every case when people were brought before, we even see this in Acts, um, where where the you know whoever has been preaching or teaching Christianity or the resurrection is given an opportunity to recant and save their own life. So you know if you're standing before the judge and the judge says. Just, just admit you made it all up and we'll let you go. Otherwise, we're going to crucify you upside down or strap you to the horns of a bull or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, you, you, if you knew it was a lie, you'd take, you, you would uh, be the first one to raise your hand and say, That's yeah, right. we made it all up. Yeah, I mean, it's just human nature. I mean, just try to, again, put yourself in that position. Or and also put yourself in the position that if you actually did see the risen Jesus, Okay, kill me. I'm going home to be with my Lord. You know, go ahead. I'm not going to recant what I saw and what I heard. I was there. I touched him. We talked. We ate together. For someone... The type, yeah. The type of death that they died, it wasn't like, oh, you know, just 
they got took out real quick, you know, like they just got shot with like how, you know, like we have guns now. I mean, it was like torture. You know, you talk about, you know, being, you know, Peter historically um, believed to have been hung upside down. Mm -hmm. You're talking about um, John, the only apostle that survived, but he was dipped in hot oil. You know, he had quarters all over his body and was exiled. So we're talking about torturous deaths, not just, you know, you just get taken out, like, oh, well, you know, I lied. Just, you know, I'll take a look what's the head kind of thing. So, I mean, I know for me, if I was lying and I was being tortured, I mean, I'm just telling the truth. I'm giving it all up. Chuck Colson talks That's about, right. you know, well, Chuck Colson, you know, with the whole, um, what was it, the scandal? Um, uh, Watergate. Watergate, yeah. He talks about how, um, I think there were, I can't remember how many, um, and it was um, before 12 guys, yeah. So, before a lot of the time, um, and uh, the whole scandal with this, um, with the government and all this stuff. So anyway, they uh, they had this they had this theory, or they all conspired. And um, uh, I think he said it took a matter of they had this conspiracy theory between them. That they would come up with to um, account for their actions, like this lie. And I can't. I think he said it took twenty four hours or something. Like yeah, what's the lie? Everybody line? just broke down and told the truth because they were promised less prison time and stuff like that. You know, so yeah. you know when you know that something's false, it's just. Like you said, it's human nature to just come clean and, you know, whenever you're going to face dire consequences, in that way. Yeah, so William Lane Craig has this um, drawing in his book, On Guard. And again, this is what you must believe, basically, if you adhere to the stolen body theory. He says, okay, so here's the plan. We get the body out of the tomb, stash it somewhere, and then we come back and tell a story that will probably get us all killed. Who's with me on this? Right? It just, it just doesn't make sense. Okay. Legend theory. I'll spend a little time on this one. The legend theory says that the resurrection was a fabrication that evolved over a long period of time to vindicate a leader long since dead. That it was something that happened long, long, long after the event. And this legend grew up around Jesus. Well, historical research indicates that a myth cannot actually begin to crowd out historical facts while the eyewitnesses are still alive. That makes sense, right? Um, even two generations is not enough time for legendary development to wipe out a hard core of historical fact. Why? Well, I think we just said it. Um, because inside of those two generations, eyewitnesses are still alive, are still around to correct the error of historical revisionists. Okay, we're starting to, this is actually why you're starting to, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, perhaps, um, people are, you, you, you may hear of Holocaust deniers. Yeah. Now, why do you think it's starting to happen around this time in history? Well, that was about 70, 80 years ago. Okay. So a lot of those folks are starting to die off and now we're getting to this past the second generation. And this is exactly what happens. Okay. That people will start to deny things, even though you would think the historical evidence is pretty strong that the Holocaust occurred, but yet people will deny it. Um, just kind of for that reason. So the idea behind this is if belief in Jesus' resurrection can be traced historically to the very early origins of Christianity, then it can't be the result of legendary development decades or centuries later. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now, the good news is, is that modern scholarship shatters this legend theory. There's an early creed contained in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, um, a creed is not, not so much like the Apostles' Creed or the Athanasian Creed. A creed, in this sense, is just a compact saying that could be easily remembered before um, the New Testament was written down. So the early Christians could learn doctrine and memorize doctrine, um, and it was passed along orally yeah, before they were put in writing. We're going to look at this in a minute. The majority of scholars believe that Paul probably received the creed that we're going to look at around 35 A.D., that's about three years after his conversion, which most likely occurred from one to three years after the crucifixion. And this is based on Galatians 1.18, where Paul says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. So three years after his conversion is what he's talking about, Paul. Um, so this creed in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, could someone read that? I need just a break from I will. talking. Sure. 
<clears throat> for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he had appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Yeah, and so scholars who, you, well, how do they know it's a creed? So this is beyond my education level, but scholars who look at this, there's a couple, I mean, I'm not going to get too much into it, but they can look at the way that it's structured and that Paul says he delivered what he received. Okay, it's kind of a rabbinic, a rabbinic type uh, saying back then that you would receive something and then pass it along. So Paul basically has received this information. He's passing it along. The way that this is structured as well, scholars can look at that and that it just it, it, it's, it differs from the rest of Paul's writings. Um, and Gary Habermas has identified about, I think about 40 or so creeds in the New Testament using that kind of methodology. Uh, this is probably the most famous one because it directly deals with the resurrection here. Um, so the way this works, so Paul wrote 1 Corinthians around 55 AD, but it has source material from the 30s. Everyone get that? So he wrote 1 Corinthians, but he's, he's using this creed that he got in the 30s, okay? Yes? From Galatians 1.18, where Paul says, after three years, I went to Jerusalem and consulted with Cephas. Right. And when Paul says after three years, he's talking about his conversion to where on the road to Damascus. He says, I delivered you what I received. So he's saying he received it from Peter and the rest. Yeah, so hopefully, this timeline hopefully will help a little bit. So about 35 AD, Paul goes to Jerusalem. This is from Galatians 1.18. And he receives. So this is when he receives the creed in 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. So the after three years, so about, if we, if we say Jesus was crucified in 30 AD, about 32 or so, Paul is converted on the road to Damascus from Acts 9. And then three years after that is when he receives the creed. So think about this. If Paul received the creed here, what does that logically imply? Was it already around before he got it? Yeah, yeah so, it was, so he, it was already around. So this is only five years after the death of Jesus. Now, some scholars will date this creed within months of the crucifixion and resurrection. Months to a year that the creed itself um, was born and originated. Paul didn't receive it until 35 AD. But again, the creed... The point is, okay, yes, received it. So let's go back to Mr. History Channel, John Dominic Crossan, skeptical scholar. You can tell he's skeptical because he says CE and not AD, right? <laughs> so he says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians from Ephesus in the early 50s, and we say about 55 in my, my graphic there. <laughs> But he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I handed on to you as a first importance, which, in, which I in turn received. So Crossan here says the most likely source in time for his reception of that tradition would have been Jerusalem in the early 30s. So this is a skeptical scholar that is also saying Paul received this creed in the early 30s. The point is, is that the accounts of the belief in the resurrection date to within at most five years, most certainly earlier, because that creed would have been around before that. It's far too early for the idea of the resurrection to be legendary. We're talking months, possibly years, a few years, not decades or much later. Does everyone follow that? So I just wanted to kind of develop that out so that you can, you can see that, because this is one you'll often hear. Oh, it's just a legend. It happened decades after. The creed is what's important here. Even though Paul wrote in the 50s, the creed is from the 30s. All right, hallucination theory. What is that? Check out my graphic. <laughs> yes, I searched long and hard on the internet to find that one. But uh, Okay, so the hallucination theory says the disciples, again, the skeptical scholars will say 
they saw something. They acknowledged that the disciples, James, Paul, they saw something. Something happened. They had some experience. Now, they won't grant that it was the risen Jesus, but they'll say it was something. So thus the hallucination theory, that the disciples sincerely thought they had seen the risen Jesus, but instead were experiencing hallucinations. Well, we're back to Cinderella. Let's try this on and see how it fits. Does anyone know anything? You don't have to tell me if it's personal experience or not, but um, what do you know? What do you just know about hallucinations in general? Yes. One person Ding. Hallucinations are usually individual experiences. Not usually, they are. Yes. <laughs> when you're hallucinating, it goes without saying, but nobody else around you can see what you're seeing. Yeah. You have to tell them what you're seeing. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, look at that body in the library, and then <laughs> right. nobody else. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see that. You don't have to tell me. I know it's black, right? Yeah. It's yeah, so, so to make an, a, an analogy here, Imagine, um, so let's say I'm asleep at night, I'm having a great dream, I'm on the beach in Hawaii, sipping a Mai Tai, soaking in the sun. I wake up, and I wake my wife, and I say, honey, honey, go back to sleep with me. We're going to go to the beach in Hawaii. That's kind of how hallucinations work. That doesn't make any sense. My wife can't have the same dream as me. I can't have the same hallucination as you. It's just, they're individual experiences. They usually last for sometimes a few seconds, a minute, or very rarely for hours. This one hung around for 40 days, this hallucination. It doesn't make sense to buy this theory. In addition, Jesus was seen walking, eating, speaking, and he was touched by witnesses. Hallucinations are not something you can physically touch. It doesn't explain the multiple appearances of Jesus. He appeared not just once, but multiple times, not just to one person, but different people, not just to individuals, but to groups of individuals, not in one location, but multiple locations, not just in one circumstance, but multiple circumstances. And he appeared not just to believers. He appeared to his enemies and his skeptics, James and Paul. So it's not just the Christians that are making, you know, the disciples that are making this up. This is, again, go back to those five facts. Only five facts, but they're very powerful because they all have to be accounted for through some kind of an alternative theory. All right? All right, you guys have been so good. We're going to get alien theory. Bonus. So, alien theory. You might even hear this one. Jesus was an alien who played a cosmic joke on mankind, on humankind, and led us to believe he died on the cross and rose from the dead. How do we handle this one? All right. Well, first of all, someone who's probably going to alien theory, they're just grasping at straws. I mean, they're just going for anything that can possibly explain these facts. Now, you're not normally going to hear this at a scholarly level. More like TV. Yeah, the internet. <laughs> but again, you might hear it. Um, now, in, in one sense, you could smile and say, you know what? I agree with you. Jesus was an alien. As a son of God, he was certainly not from this world. Okay? It's kind of tongue in cheek. But what, it, right, all this ancient alien stuff that's on TV, like some people, I mean, what if you come across someone who really, um, you know, that they view this as a serious alternative theory? What, what do you say? Okay, so let's, let's refute this theory then. It actually, here's the thing, it actually doesn't deny that Jesus was resurrected, only that God was the cause of it. Okay, it's not saying he didn't rise, Okay. Aliens usually arrive in spaceships. Jesus was born on Earth. <laughs> Aliens usually appear for a very short time. Jesus was on Earth for over 30 years. Okay, just some things to keep in mind. It sounds good. Oh, he's an alien, but... Um, usual reports of aliens 
uh, described them as abusive, Jesus was loving and compassionate. All right. So just a few things to kind of refute the alien theory. Um, and there's some other ones too. That if you that the Gary Habermas book, there's some other theories out there too. Just too much to get into tonight. These are kind of the the main ones that we went over tonight. Um, I threw in alien theory for fun, but um, <laughs> but anyway. So in conclusion, alternative explanations of the resurrection fail in multiple ways. I would argue. They may account for some of the facts, but they can't account for all of the facts, which they need to do. And there's actually even seven more facts that Gary Habermas has come up with as well. Um, I mentioned a couple of them, like Jesus uh, executed in Jerusalem, Christianity started in Jerusalem. Like Those are facts too. Uh, But these five that we talked about, they still have to account for all these facts. We mentioned already the predominant view, often of these alternative theories, is naturalism which regards the natural material, physical universe as the only reality. Everything must be explained within nature because that's all there is in that worldview. Nothing supernatural, nothing beyond nature exists. Keep this in mind too. Just the mere assertion of an opposing theory, that's, that doesn't do anything to prove that theory. That's just an assertion. If someone makes some kind of crazy um, claim uh, as an alternative theory, I mean, you could, we've gone through some of the refutations, but you could also ask them, that's an interesting theory. Can you like flesh that out for me? Like, tell me more about why you believe that and make them, um, since they're making the claim, make them defend the claim as well. So something to keep in mind too, just because it's an assertion, don't get, oh no, they have to prove that. Okay. They have to come up with some facts. Oh, okay. Um, I do. All right, here we go. I want to show a quick video. It's about four minutes. Why isn't it going up there? That's weird. So what I took, um, uh oh, oh, there it is. What I took about an hour, no, not quite an hour, 50 minutes to go over. This video is going to explain, and it's a good summary, a four and a half minute video, okay? And this is a good one, too, to, you know, search it out on the uh, internet. Uh Uh-oh. Why isn't it showing? Can you try to drag it over to the right? Come, I don't know. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The Bible. You're reading the Bible? Yeah. Dude, why are you reading the Bible? Oh, no. Okay, so you're just reading the Bible. You're just sitting here in a coffee shop in the 21st century using state-of-the-art technology to read ancient myths for no reason whatsoever. Well, tell me something. Are you one of those super religious people who thinks Jesus actually rose from the dead? Well, I do believe that. You also believe in the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, unicorns, Bigfoot. Ever been abducted by aliens? And do you buy into all those other ancient myths about dying and rising gods invented by primitive nomadic tribes back in the Bronze Age? No. Okay, so what's the difference between Jesus rising from the dead and all those other fairy tales? Here's the difference. My belief in the resurrection of Jesus is rational. It's based on historical facts. (laughs) Facts? What facts? Well, first, Jesus died by crucifixion. Whoa, hold on. We don't even know if Jesus existed. Why should I believe your facts? Well, because the five facts I'm going to give you are backed by so much historical evidence that most professional critical scholars who study the subject accept them as true. That includes skeptical atheist scholars. Okay, so Jesus was a guy who actually existed and then got himself killed. So what? That's the first fact. Second, his disciples were convinced that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. Third, Paul, a sworn enemy of the early Christians, suddenly became a Christian. Fourth, Jesus' skeptical brother James also became a Christian. And fifth, the tomb where they put Jesus' body was empty. And those are well-established historical facts. Right, but you can't just leave it there. These facts demand an explanation. Otherwise, you've got a big hole in human history. Okay, here's an explanation. They all lied. It was a conspiracy. The most monumental prank ever perpetrated. His followers stole his corpse from the tomb and then started telling everybody he was alive. 
That's the conspiracy theory. The problem is it doesn't explain the facts. How do a few spineless fishermen, cringing in fear for their lives, subdue a bunch of well-armed, professional Roman guards, roll away a two-ton stone, steal a body, then hide it from a city swarming with people trying to find it? And why would they do it? The disciples had absolutely nothing to gain by lying about Jesus' resurrection. In fact, they were persecuted. And we have good historical evidence that five of them were martyred because of their claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Apparently not a single one of them ever recanted. People don't willingly die for something they know isn't true. They were there. They knew whether it was true or not. All right, another theory. The disciples thought they saw Jesus alive after he died, but it was just wishful thinking. They were stressed and just kind of hallucinating. The hallucination theory also lacks explanatory power. 500 witnesses saw Jesus at the same time, and the disciples touched him. Psychologists have shown that hallucinations don't work like that, nor does this explain the empty tomb. Okay, look, maybe there's some other explanation, but the bottom line is dead people stay dead. Rising from the dead would be a supernatural event, a miracle, and science has proven that miracles don't happen. Oh, really? When did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of heard it somewhere. Science is not disproven miracles. In fact, that would be impossible. Why? Science deals exclusively with natural phenomena. Physical matter and material processes, right? Uh, yeah. But a miracle, by definition, is not a natural phenomenon. It's supernatural. So? So a supernatural event would lie outside the boundaries of science. It's logically impossible for science to throw out any hypothesis that lies outside its boundaries. Why have I never heard this stuff before? I don't know. Maybe because it's scary? Scary? Yeah. As long as Jesus rising from the dead is just a fairy tale, like Santa Claus and unicorns, it doesn't threaten my little world. But if it's a fact, if he actually did rise from the dead, that's huge. It's a total game changer. And that's why it's so hard to think about it objectively. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big one.